My name is Hermann Kuncher from Carl Square Equity Research. Recently, on the 4th of February, Biosurgeon announced positive results in their uh, current pivotal trial in India. And to discuss these results, I have with me by link uh, Tina Olsen, uh, who is the CEO of Biosurgeon. Thank you. All right, Tina. So first off, could you please give us an overview of the trial and your recently published results for the second cohort? What was the study design and the aim and what are the key takeaways from your newest findings? Yeah, so the study is uh, a study in life-threatening fungal disease. That's what we do. Um, we treat invasive fungal infections. And the study is uh, aiming for patients that have no uh, other treatment options. So we call it rescue therapy. So the patients that are entering into the study and get BST, uh, either it's because they don't have uh, effect of standard of care, or they cannot tolerate standard of care. So there's no other treatment options left for them. We have in, it's a dose escalation study, and we have in total treated 10 patients, which is uh, two cohorts. So the study is also governed by an independent safety committee uh, consisting of infectious diseases specialists, and they decide in between cohorts if we can escalate the dose and if we can treat longer, et cetera. So if I were to sum up uh, the first 10 patients we have treated, then you could say we had two patients that recovered completely. We had six patients that had improved significantly. We had one patient uh, who withdrew consent um, after the first dose. And then we had one patient that unfortunately passed. Um, and that is not due to BSG. Uh, it was before he received a BSG. We have not seen any uh, severe side effects. Uh, we have some adverse events, some side effects where we have special interest, and that's uh, the kidneys. Um, we have not seen anything uh, with regard to kidney impairment. We have not seen anything uh, with regard to cardiac health or any uh, major um, issues with the electrolytes. So all in all, I think we have a very good safety profile. And if we then take a deeper dive of the patient, because I think that's also super interesting. And um, I can say patients with Aspergillus, and that's the majority of the 10 patients, uh, they, the patients that we received in that category, they have resistance formation towards standard of care. We have managed to uh, actually get significant improvement in those type of patients. Then we had uh, two patients with mucormycosis. Mucormycosis is, is also called a black fungus. And the black fungus is kind of an infection you get, and then it starts eating you from inside. So often for mucormycosis, you get with standard of care, you get treated for two weeks, and then uh, you go through surgery. This two weeks is often uh, not giving excellent results, but we did what we did with BST was we treated for longer at higher doses. So we kind of contained the infection and uh, the patients got better and better, meaning they were a better candidate for surgery. So we de-risked the surgery. And also when you do this surgery, you remove the dead tissue and the infection. And if you then have a place where you have less infection, it's easier to remove. So instead of having an infection in a complete lung and have to remove a lung, then we could get it down to, if you had an infection in, in the full lung, then we could minimize it into one lobe with BSC, and then you only had to remove one lobe, which is super good for uh, both the uh, treating physician, but also for the patients to maintain uh, so much quality of life. So, uh, and then we had one patient, which is also outstanding, I think, is uh, a patient that had both aspergillus and mucormycosis. So it was a co-infection, a mis mixed infection. And you often see these mixed infections. Um, and this patient uh, also improved significantly. 
So that's super good news. Um, and then we have, um, you could say we have bad news because uh, we're supposed to treat another cohort, cohort three. And we will do that, but we'll do it later because due to the fact that we went high up in doses, much higher than we expected we could, and due to the fact that we prolonged the duration of treatment, then we used all the stock and we used, we, we simply don't have any more uh, clinical trial material. So we have to produce new before we can actually uh, finalize uh, cohort three. So cohort three results will hibernate a little bit. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, about this uh, delayed production or your need to bump up production, does that alter anything in terms of your budget uh, going forward or has this been accounted for? Yeah, so we knew we uh, had to produce new, new material for phase two and three for moving forward simply in clinical development. And now we have to do it a little bit earlier and we expect to have material ready by the uh, Q4 in 2025, as we have also stated in the press release we sent out. Mm, okay, and uh, for the overarching plan for 2025, can you give an overview there? What else can we look forward to? So we will do this manufacturing, um, and on top of that, uh, I think we have news. Uh, for We have finalized cohort two, we're still waiting for our independent uh, data safety review committee uh, to come out with their interpretation of the data. So they will decide, uh, should we increase the dose even further? Should we treat longer? Should we stay at the same dose level or should we complete uh, the study? So that particular um, news will come out here in March, April. Um, and then on top of that, uh, we pl also plan to contact different um, authorities. An obvious one is CDSCO, which is the Indian authorities, because we are doing trials in India. We'll also contact FDA and we are planning for a pre-IND meeting and hopefully an IND uh, by the end of the year. Okay, thank you. And you mentioned that you reached doses of two milligrams per, per kilogram in your patients. Um, what can you give us more about the uh, observed adverse effects? Uh, were there anything that stood out to you or was everything you know, in line with what you expected? I, I think it's, uh, it's in line with what we expected. Uh, and if uh, there was any concern, this independent uh, safety review board would have raised the flag. I think, uh, on the contrary, I think they're very positive. Also, uh, I don't know if, uh, yeah, anyone read it, but during the trial, uh, there was an extra request to expand uh, the treatment period and also go to higher doses. And the safety review committed, committee said, yes, please, uh, you can expand both with longer treatment and higher doses. So I, th I think uh, on the safety side, uh, it looks good and um, it's always risk benefit. So when they see a major improvement, uh, then it's also something hopefully with a low risk, it's something that is positive. Mm -hmm. And uh, although it's still early days yet, uh, and there's definitely some more dose finding left in the pipeline, uh, given these new results, what do you judge uh, or the chances uh, that BSG will commercialize around two milligrams instead of uh, one milligram? So uh, that I cannot say yes, because this was like a proof of concept. So we are almost dosing individually, but there's a scheme and it's a dose escalation. We don't want to do a dose escalation when we come to the market. We want to have a dose, but often in this therapeutic field, the um, the dosing depends on what kind of fungal strains you have. But one thing I find um, for all patients, whether it's a MUCO patient or an Aspergillus patient, is the thing that we have a long treatment duration and the patients tolerate it. That means a lot because uh, the, the, if you can treat longer at a high dose, it's 
very beneficial for the patients. But the actual dosing, we don't know before we have made uh, a phase two study. Okay, and given these you know, strong and promising results, has anything changed when it comes to your expectations for possible MPU sales uh, uh, and the possibility of them starting earlier? Or has anything changed with your thoughts regarding the coming studies and how they will be designed? Yeah, I think uh, we have learned a lot. Uh, we have learned a tremendous amount uh, with this study. Uh, we are um, less skeptical <laughs> uh, with BST. We have figured out that uh, resistant strains, which is one of the uh, the flags that WHO and Center for Disease Control have raised the flag about, we have a good chance of being able to beat resistant strains. So that will have an impact on our program. And then um, I think all in all, we have we have a we have a better platform to actually decide what we want to do in our phase two and three. But we're beginning to see the population. Yes, mm -hmm. we're aiming uh, for. And uh, given that you know things are starting to to heat up, will you need to expand your team in order to juggle all these different activities, or or will you be able to continue to stay as lean as you have been historically? Yeah, so uh, Biosurgeon has uh, primarily used consultants um, and we will to to save on on uh, daily cost. And I think we'll continue to do that. We have um, we have some very good consultants that has been with us for a long time who finds this area extremely interesting and they're doing a super job. Uh, they're engaged and it's almost like it's their own company. We will continue with them and, and the lean model. Okay, so now you also did some reshuffling of the board. I think it was quite recently at least. Uh, how do these uh, reshufflings impact your, your work going forward? I think it was a, a good decision to uh, change the board because we're going into a new, um, with new activities with uh, development. Uh, both on the CMC and regulatory and clinical development, we're covered there. We need access to more experts, uh, antifungal experts, we're covered. We also need uh, more focus on the commercial part, like uh, trying to find partnership, um, trying to be more open to the world. So I think uh, this reshuffling, have, have, we have gained a lot of uh, expertise uh, from the new board members, and it's a pleasure to work with them. Okay, and uh, in terms of future studies, uh, will you be looking at BSG in a head-to-head -head versus, for example, drugs like Ambisome? Will you look at uh, BSG in, in conjunction with a fungostatic, for example, or how do you envision that? So the, um, in a regulatory perspective, you always need a control group. If you look at the study we do today, then the control group will be patients without medicine because we're choosing a group that have tried everything and nothing works. So that would be a placebo group. Uh, uh, if we talk about any other disease or indication, yes, you have to compare yourself with standard of care. Um, and so if it is aspergillus, yes, uh, we're probably up against a uh, acyl, a fungistatic compound versus the um, fungicidal compound, which is us. So uh, you will always need a control. Then you can say we are an IV infusion. Uh, we can only treat for, it's only fair to treat patients for four weeks, maybe six weeks. Um, and then you probably need some kind of uh, home care or therapy. Um, and in the pipeline, we of course have, you know, we would like to do an oral therapy as well. Or we also have our nanotechnology. All right. Thank you very much for your answers, Tina. Yeah, and thank you for having me. Uh, I think sometimes it's very good to hear a little bit more than uh, what we can um, explain in a press release. So I enjoy these sessions very much. Thank you.